Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. On behalf of the Department of Military Instruction and the Modern War Institute, I'd like to uh, welcome you all to today's speaker series event with Great Commander of Retired Robert Scales. Robert Scales is the president of Georgia Incorporated, a consulting firm specializing in issues related to land power, war gaming, and strategic leadership. He is also currently serves as Fox News Channel and Military Analyst and is an adjunct scholar for the Modern War. For 30 years, he served in the Army in several capacities, including commanding two years in Vietnam, as well as serving in Germany and Korea in commanding staff positions. Scales is an esteemed author, who is the only serving officer to have his written book subsequently selected for inclusion in the official reading lists for the Army, Marine Corps, and the Navy. He retired from the U U.S. military service as a Major General after serving as the Commandant of the United States Army War College. Following his service, he created the Army After Next program, which was the Army's first attempt to build strategic game and operational concepts for future land warfare. General Scales graduated from West Point and earned his PhD in history from Duke University. Please help me give him a yeah. welcome. Thank you. Thanks. Well, thank you all very much for coming uh, right after lunch. I, I uh, we spent most of the lunch hour telling war stories. And uh, uh, what really got me started down this road uh, was in Vietnam. I commanded the 2nd 319th the Firebase Birch's Garden during the Battle of Hamburger Hill. And I'd, actually, I'd been in the midst of connubial bliss with my lovely wife at uh, Hawaii. And I got a call, get back. Uh, B Battery Commander had just been killed. And, you're taking the battery, and, uh, and so I, after four days of r and I flew back, took over command of this outfit, and four days later, we got overrun by the 29th, the, 20, the NVA 29th Regiment. Um, and I lost, uh, I had 105 prior to the first incident at Firebirds Airborne. I had 55 that I commanded, and then I lost 19 when we got over. I had like a 30-man battery when it was all over, and I remember se sitting on this, it was like a scene out of Apocalypse Now. You know, I'm sitting on all these ammo boxes, my head in my hands, and this great guy came up behind me. His name was Harold Erickson. His call sign was Viking. Back in those days, we had radio call signs. We called each other, and he, he came up behind me, and a big, burly guy, uh, Viking, because his name was Erickson. He commanded B Company first, the 506th, the Band of Brothers uh, Company. and. Uh, he came up behind me. He always had a toothbrush. He was cleaning his car 15. And he said to me, uh, OK, Scales, what are you going to do now? And I remember, I'll never forget this. I said, well, Viking, lately I've been giving serious consideration uh, to law school. Uh, and he said, no, no, no. What are you going to do now? And I said, well, Viking, I have no clue. And for the next three or four hours, Viking led me through a graduate level course on tactics and how to defend a fire base. And it, I remember he said to me, well, you're probably going to die anyway, but just come with me. And, and it was that event that sort of sparked my interest in this book that I've written today and has for, for my whole career. Remember now, I'm an artilleryman. Just get that clear. Uh, and, uh, uh, and, and, and it occurred to me as a, a, a brand new captain that that, that, that I would never again come in number two in a two-sided conflict. Uh, that, that as far as I was concerned, uh, we were overrun by a unit that was better trained, better equipped, better motivated, better led than we were. And I wasn't going to let that happen again. And so that's sort of what led me along my career path to study this particular level of war. Now, I've been in the futures business now for 25 years this year. I started in uh, 1991 when uh, I was asked by the Chief of Staff of the Army to write the official history of the Gulf War. It was a book titled Certain Victory. Many of you may have read it. I don't know. But, uh, um, and I did. And since it was my first general officer assignment, I wasn't stupid. And I went ahead and followed all the precepts of Schwarzkopf's Great Wheel. Um, and, uh, and, and I had a wonderful team that helped me put everything together and do the research for this book. Uh, but three things bothered me from that experience. Number one was that in a war where 
the enemy puts up so little resistance. It becomes a one-sided contest, unlike most wars. And in a one-sided contest like Desert Storm, virtually everything worked. So if someone has some dumbass idea, uh, you could say, well, that's a dumbass idea. And he turns to you and says, yeah, but it worked. Uh, yeah, but everything worked. The second thing I took away from that was that this was an incomplete maneuver. Uh, I remember we got deeply involved in the what ifs of the 101st being able to establish AO Eagle north of the Euphrates, west of Basra, and what that might have uh, done strategically had this maneuver been completed and the retreat of the Republican Guard would have been blocked and perhaps we never would have gone back there in 2003. <laughs> that bothered me. Number three was I realized in 1992 that the reason I wrote the book is that I was participating in an inner service war with the Air Force and we were losing. Um, the takeaway was uh, from the three Charlies, uh, you may, uh, uh, Charlie Dunlop, Charlie Link, uh, who was the other Charlie, uh, three Air Force uh, generals who came after uh, those of us who were in the land services and tried to uh, proclaim that this was a victory that was earned strictly through the use of air power. This led to such things as, you remember, uh, shock and awe, net-centric warfare, effects-based operations, blah, blah, blah. And, they, and, and the, the, halt, uh, uh, the HALT theory, remember that from Rebecca Grant, air power will hold everybody back not to worry, train up the National Guard, they will provide the land force and we can save many millions, billions of dollars. And it was working uh, even as late as the end, of the, the, end of, the, uh, of the century. Both political candidates, as part of their platform, were talking about an eight division army. Many of you may remember that. Any of you commissioned before 9-11, just to make sure? Yeah, oh well then you know what I'm talking about. So, um, so that was the third thing, that this was a war of ideas a war that I thought I was pretty pleased with in a war that we were losing. Uh, in 1995, I headed up, as you said, the Army After Next uh, initiative, and it was the first time that, well, one other thing I learned, very interesting lesson in writing Certain Victory. I, I learned that as a serving soldier, I would never again write a piece of contemporary history till every player was stone cold graveyard dead. I was good up to about the Peloponnesian Wars. After that, there's some asshole out there somewhere with a cousin who I've insulted. So contemporary history is a dangerous thing. So in, in, uh, I took over the Army After Next idea. And, and the thing that I found so frustrating about Army After Next is that many of the ideas that we had in the 90s, in the mid 90s, have subsequently become baked into uh, today's future warfare lexicon. Things like operational maneuver from strategic distances. Yours was uh, strategic maneuver from the sea. Um, oh gosh. Uh, uh, the human dimension, the unblinking eye, combined arms at company level, uh, brigade-based maneuver. Um, uh, 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 interdependence, which now is called joint interdependence back then, yeah, that was an oxymoron. And most importantly, this idea of the unblinking eye. All of those things were, we felt were transformational, but several things happened to prevent that, which gets me to the book. Number one was, the problem is when you do future gazing is with what's called early lock. If you lock on an idea too early, when the technology is immature, you run the risk of being disproved simply because you can't fulfill the concept with materiel. That's what happened to us. So that those material fill-ins that happened after we came up with our concepts, things like the objective force, you remember that, striker, and ultimately FCS, at the end of the day pretty much all failed because the technology wasn't there to support the concepts. And the second thing I walked away with was that the Army really didn't want to do it. There was still this, 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 uh, this uh, belief on the part of many of the se uh, senior officers in the Army that what we were talking about of a light maneuverable Army that was, uh, that had a, every component of the, of the uh, 
of combat with a component in the vertical dimension, blah, blah, blah. All of that was off the mark. And by 2008, it was gone. And the third element, of course, that changed everything was 9-11. Anytime you start off from zero in a war, you tend to pull in your horizon. It's just human nature. You don't worry about operational maneuver from strategic distances when you can't fix the IED problem. And increasingly, the Army leadership started to pull in that threat horizon to deal with the here and now. And then the collapse of FCS in 2008 in many ways sort of paralyzed the Army and made them afraid of the future in the sense that we don't want to necessarily risk a leap ahead again simply because we've been burned by it too often. We're like 0 for 22 in major program starts in the Army over the last 15 years. So, I wrote a book called Yellow Smoke that talked about this. And one day, in two, November 2004, I get a phone call at home. <laughs> and uh, I, hello, he said, is this General Scales? I said, yes, it is. He said, he said, my name is Mattis, Jim Mattis. And he said, I just read your book. And I said, yes, sir. He said, I need your help. He said, uh, a lot of the things you said in the book, I believe, are true. He said, with apologies to my Marine Corps friend here, he says, we in the Marine Corps don't like to air our dirty laundry. And I want you to come and talk to us and offer us suggestions on how to make the Marine Corps more viable at the tactical level. Remember, this is about, he commanded the division in Fallujah. This is about two weeks after the end of that first battle of Fallujah. I said I would. And that's what started a relationship between Jim Mattis and me, and I dedicate my book to Mattis. Because he's the one that pulled me down off my operational perch and focused me on what he considered to be the next big thing, which is the convergence between the tactical and the, and the strategic levels of war. Now, the hero in my book is a guy named Hiromichi Yahara. Have you heard of that gentleman before? Is a, if you ever watch that mega weapons thing on, on A&E, uh, he actually has a whole segment now on mega weapons. But Yahara was a, was a senior advisor to General Cho, who commanded the Japanese 32nd Army on Okinawa. And he was sent by the Imperial General Staff to watch how the Okinawa battle played off, first battle fought on Japanese soil, to find out how to improve the Japanese method of war so that they could defend against the invasion of Honshu, which they knew was right around the corner. Cho was a nasty, typical Japanese officer, uh, but Yahara was different. He was tall, thin, imperious, a little bit of feet, um, soft-spoken, intellectual. He had been the commandant of the Imperial Japanese War College, which of course endears him to my heart, and he'd served as an attache in the United States in Washington, so he knew us. And the thing I found so, and then he writes a book, very interesting. Yahara <laughs> dies in 1972, the year the U.S. stopped its combat operations in Vietnam. Wonderful bookends. And Yohara, uh, when it time came for ritual seppuku in the caves at the edge of, uh, of the island, General Cho pulled him inside and said, we're going to commit suicide, you're not. They dressed him up as a fisherman, put him in a fishing boat. Three days later, he gets captured by the Americans, put into a POW cage, and lived through the war, and of course that bothered him till the day he died, that he didn't join uh, his comrades in death. But he wrote a series of books and lectures over the coming year. In many ways, what Yahara saw and what he wrote about has really been with us ever since, and let me explain. He said that the dropping of the atom bomb on Japan fundamentally changed the general epochs, if you will, of control over the art of war. He said that the European era, as you know, uh, started from what the early 16th century with the colonization of the world um, through the use of imperial forces and the, and, the, and the people they colonized were subjugated during the European era of war. But all that changed in 1949 where the 500 year reign on the battlefield by European armies against native enemies, European enemies, uh, was over. 
and it now belonged to us. It belonged to the United States. And he said the United States will not necessarily fight every war in the future, but the long shadow of the American way of war will, will permeate every single war that's fought from now on. Amazing. His second observation, which he found prophetic, was Americans are extremely difficult to kill. He was amazed by that because he'd fought in China in the 30s, and the Chinese were fairly easy to kill. Americans were very hard. And, and he said, as a rule, the closer the Americans come to us, the easier they are to kill. The, more, the further away they are, the more difficult. His third observation was, to beat the Americans, you have to spot them, the air and the sea. Japanese had tried that beginning at Pearl Harbor for the last two and a half years, and it, and it had failed. What he discovered was the only way to beat the Americans was on the ground. The third thing he discovered, and he wrote about, was that the American strategic center of gravity was public opinion. Remember now, it's June 1945. Hitler had just surrendered. The greatest public, public relations expert in the American military was Dwight Eisenhower. He was able to shape public opinion through the media brilliantly. The worst was Douglas MacArthur. Everybody hated him. And Yohara read our newspapers, and he said, now the American people are sick and tired of seeing tens of thousands of their sons being killed for bits of rock and coral. He said that maybe the surest way to affect American public opinion is to kill Americans. Not to kill Americans as a means to an end, as we did, but to kill Americans as an end in itself. You know, it's that great quote uh, from, can I take my jacket off? This is really hot out here with a wool jacket on. He said that, he said that, uh, oh, that, that, that uh, great quote from Ho Chi Minh. Remember this? He said to a French journalist, you will kill a hundred of us, we will kill one of you, and you will tire of it first. Reflects the philosophy of General Yahar. So he said, how do you kill Americans? What do you do differently? And he said many things. It's all, he lists them all in his book. You hide, you go to ground, you fight among the people, you camouflage yourself, you disperse, you dig in. Uh, you use tactical forces and you willingly spend lives just to kill a few Americans. So over time, those statistics will stack up. And, and he said our strategic objectives in, the, in, in Japan is number one, to keep the Americans from invading the home island, check. And number two, prevent the Americans for, from deposing the emperor, check. He was two for two. And he believed, till the day he died, that the reason he was successful in doing that is because he, they, the Japanese, made the battle for Okinawa so horrific. And then the next thing he observed, which is, he, and this is where I take over the narrative, is that there was good news and bad news in this new American era. Oh, one other thing about Yohara I find so interesting, is that Yohara's principles of fighting Americans applies across the whole spectrum of conflict. It applies at the low end, in Panama, all the way up to the near peer war, say, in Korea. And the principles apply regardless of where the Americans fight. And here's the other thing. For those enemies that former colonial powers, that uh, former uh, col uh, 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 colonials who fight former colonial powers, they're 6 and 0. Oh. It works, the Yohara method. I mean, the four Arab-Israeli wars, US and Vietnam and Korea, the, uh, the French in Indochina, and the Russians in Afghanistan, all victories following the Ohara method. And my interpretation of that is that it's good news and bad news. First, the bad, first the, the bad news. As O'Hara says in his book, just at the time when American technology and material dominance and on the battlefield begins to become ascendant, the whole structure of the epochal shifts in the, war, in, the, in the nature and character of war started to change. Look, you guys invited me here. Before you invited me, you knew I was a historian. I'm going to tell you some history. You can't leave. 
So just bear with me. This is very quick. By the way, the ideas I'm giving to you now are not, not all mine. They come from a whole uh, a, a culture of military theorists. P people like the godfather, Bill Lind, you know him, Dave Johnson, T.H. Hammies, who is a retired Marine, Frank Hoffman, also a retired Marine. This whole school of thought is kind of what I'm laying on you here. Remember, the first epoch of warfare, going back to the beginning of recorded history, was the age of muscle-powered warfare, human and animal muscles that was principally based around a clash of infantry, the legion, uh, the phalanx, that was determined by the, 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 the physical strength of the opposing forces. All that changed in 427 at the Battle of Adrianople, where agricultural science uh, engineered the horse to perform as a useful instrument of war, added to that as the invention of the stirrup. So we had the, uh, you had the step ponies uh, uh, in, in Central Asia, you had the uh, Arab horses of the Saracens, you had the dray horses of the Western <coughs> European mounted knight, shifted uh, the, the fundamental of nature of war from dismounted to mounted. That lasted until 1525. At the Battle of Pavia, when just poor, impoverished Spanish infantrymen wielding an instrument called a harquebus uh, suddenly taught the rest of the world that a little three-quarter inch piece, a, 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 a three-ounce piece of lead could penetrate the armor of the cream of French nobility. And the shift went from mounted to dismounted warfare. That lasted, of course, until the first precision revolution in the late 19th century, where the invention of smokeless powder, small bore rifle, the machine gun, uh, quick firing artillery, uh, the telegraph, the railroad, all of that increased the deadliness of the battlefield by a factor of six, made war a 12 month endeavor, and led to the deaths of 12 million infantrymen. Uh, in the trenches of the Western Front. And that shifted the war. And you notice each of these shifts occurs almost one-tenth, within one-tenth of the age of the previous one. And that led to the mounted era of warfare, which suited us perfectly. So patent roaring across the northern plains of Europe became our ability to translate industrial might and our technological prowess into effects on the battlefield. And that's how we thought it would go. And then, slowly but surely, as O'Hara predicted, as Yahara predicted, the pendulum swung again to favor dismounted forces. And for the last 70 years, as much as we've had spikes in our mounted warfare in Desert Storm and in the march to Baghdad, the general trend, trend throughout the world, when former colonial powers are now turning around and facing their colonizers, we see militaries shedding their self, themselves of their World War II mounted impedimenta. Classic example, as we talked about earlier this morning, of the Russians. The Russians, my god, this is an organization that is built around the tank uh, and the artillery piece today. Uh, the strategic ends are being achieved by little green men. And who are these? Well, they're GRU, FRS, Spetsnaz, uh, naval infantry, special forces, elite infantry, all dismounted forces amplified with certain niche technologies. Over the last 25 years, armies of the world have shed over 85,000 pieces of mechanized equipment. And if you get beyond what we say we're going to do as a nation, and you watch what we do as a nation, as our enemies are, you'll see that increasingly the way we fight is moving away from a mounted approach to warfare, as is also true for our allies. That's the bad news. Just as America dominates, just as America is ready to fight shock and awe, effects-based operations, and all that other crap that we see coming out of Washington, then the pendulum shifts and we get back to a more primitive approach to war. We would fight with air and sea power if we could, but the enemy is following Yahara's game plan. They're spotting us the air, space. They're spotting us the sea, forcing, uh, forcing us to confront them on the ground, where their object of the other day ultimately is to kill us, not as an end, but as a, not as a means to an end, but as an end in itself. That's the bad news. Here's the good news. For a long time after the beginning of the American epoch, the technology applied to the science of war 
favored big boxes. Ships, airplanes, <coughs> heavy mounted equipment, it's, et cetera. But over the last 15 or 20 years, after those of us in Army After Next missed the technological boat, much of that has started to shift in the other direction. And the currents of change are all around you. In fact, I have one in my pocket right here. That micro miniaturization, that the, uh, that the uh, beginning of social networking and cellular networking throughout the world, the micro miniaturization of precision that allows soldiers to kill with something on their shoulder rather than something mounted in the tank, uh, the ability to achieve information dominance with off the shelf material, uh, and on and on is beginning to show a shift where the technology that is being applied to active forces, those forces that do the killing and dying, is increasingly moving away from mounted maneuver to dismounted maneuver. And the Marines are the ones, I think, who have glommed onto that and embraced it. We tried this 25 years ago. The, the technology simply wasn't there. So what does all this mean to my book? And it comes down to three numbers, 81, 4, and 1. 81, 4, and 1. 81 percent of all Americans killed at the hands of the enemy, absent disease and accidents, have been infantrymen. Not soldiers or Marines, but infantrymen. Here's the, where the four comes in. They comprise about 4% of the uniform services in DOD. That's Army and Marine Infantry and Special Operating Forces. A force somewhere between 50 and 55,000, depending on how you count it. The one. The 1% 1 is the percent of the DOD budget today, in this year's budget, that's dedicated to tactical forces, to close combat forces. That's for training and for the equipping of small units. Now, the argument gets all wacko when you go inside the beltway because the Navy stands up and says, well, wait a minute. Aircraft carriers support the infantry. So that's part of this package, right? No, it's not. In fact, what we see increasingly happen is that the big deterrence machines that we build for, by the way, anybody know what a Ford class carrier costs? 14 billion. That's before you put one airplane on it. But these ships that were designed to sink enemy fleets have almost universally been repurposed to support ground forces. Same with aircraft. Aircraft B1s and B2s that were originally designed for, for a nuclear strike are now dropping dumb bombs to support ground forces. You see how this shift has affected us. Now, what the defense intellectuals inside the Beltway will tell you, well, yeah, this is just, this is, you know, the, our day will come. Well, hang on a second. When was the last time the United States fought a major ship-to-ship -ship sea engagement for dominance of the seas? The year I was born, April 1944. When was the last time uh, our air power was uh, uh, where we contested airspace for dominance? for air dominance, Christmas offensive in 1972. When was the last time we put at risk a soldier, Marine, or special operating forces on the ground? What time is it? So that's what the focus of my book is about. If our greatest vulnerability as a nation is public opinion, if the surest way to affect public <coughs> opinion is to kill Americans, if the largest number of Americans killed by the enemy by design, according to O'Hara's template, are infantrymen. Wouldn't it make sense as a nation that we devote more resources to keeping alive those most likely to die? Doesn't that make sense? Well, when I go see my friends on Capitol Hill, they open their eyes and they say, OK, General Scales, I got this. So why don't I hear this? from the administration. Why don't I hear this from the Secretary of Defense? And the answer is very simple, I don't know. But I wrote this book to make this point. And so people always say to me, by the way, how much time have I got? I'm running my mouth here. A few more minutes? They say to me, okay, so what do you do? What's the 
what's the great, uh, what's the great equalizer? What's the thing that you want to bring forward that will move us from a force on the ground that's, that is superior to one that's dominant, that gives the chance of survival uh, uh, for an, uh, an, an infantryman equal to or greater than, say, for a fighter pilot? And the answer is it doesn't, it's not that simple. That success at the tactical level of war is so complex because you're in, involved in such a complex medium that it's a stacking of capabilities over time that eventually, the sum of which will eventually lead to tactical dominance on the battlefield. What are those things? Okay, first is something we came up 25 years ago, the unblinking eye. Okay, second war story. Hang in, guys. Uh, this won't take, this is a shorter war story. Um, after the Battle of Luz in April 1950, the British Imperial General Staff, as they always did, in trying to solve a military problem, had a seminar on Salisbury Plain. This is after the regular British Army was devastated and Kitchener's Army was being rebuilt for the offense in 19, offensive in 1916. The question is, we've got to solve our problems. And one of the problems was the great surprise on the Western Front was the overwhelming killing power of the machine gun, the German Spandau machine gun. So the question is, only the British would do this. It was something like this, resolved. The current apportionment of Vickers machine guns for the regiment is 12. Should it be increased to 18 or perhaps even 24? Well, now we know 100 years on that the answer was 2,000. My point, you see my point, that the machine gun disease was so pervasive uh, in armies in Western Europe at that time, that it took almost 40 years to understand that small caliber weapons and machine guns were now dominant in the close fight, and virtually every maneuver soldier had to have one. The Germans figured this out in 1944, the Russians in 1947, the AK-47, and we figured it out just a few years ago when we authorized full automatic fire for all of our close combat soldiers. That's the disease. And I see the same thing today with the unblinking eye. What do we mean by unblinking eye? We mean drones. You know, I sat there in my living room in 2010 and watched as President Obama hung the Medal of Honor around Saul Gento. Remember that? The first American, living American to be given the Medal of Honor since Vietnam. I was in tears. And I was in tears not because I was so happy. I was in tears because I was furious. Did you read the citation? Tell me how a squad of 14, 15 soldiers walking across the spine of a ridgeline in 2007 would allow the Taliban, 100 of them, to close within 30 or 40 feet of that formation and kill three in 2007, please. Why wasn't there something over that unit? Why do you realize in wars in the American era, more than half of all Americans killed at the hands of the enemy were killed trying to find the enemy. Did you know that? From movements to contact, ambushes, IEDs, and booby traps. That's what kills America. If we get the enemy in our embrace, we'll kill him with our firepower. The problem is finding him. So why don't we do a better job of that? And the answer, the first answer, of course, is drones. And in the book, I write about drones in three layers. A strategic level, not to kill Osama bin Laden for for uh, newspaper headlines, but to downlink to some device in the hands of a squad leader so he can see is what's around him. A second level, intermediate level, orbiting above a brigade combat team, an armed drone that's able, perhaps even with non-kinetic means, to kill people out 10 feet in front of you. And the third, intrusive drones, drones that are able in close combat, particularly in cities and complex terrain, to intrude through windows, walk up stairways, find the enemy, and hopefully, if they're explosive, to blow up and kill it. Think what a difference that would make. Oh, and here's the thing, guys. Unlike DARPA, this isn't Star Wars. This is popular mechanics. This isn't Northrop Grumman and Lockheed. It's friggin' Walmart. These are not highly complex technologies. Why don't we flood our soldiers with drones like we learned to do with automatic arms not 50 years ago? Bureaucracy, inter-service bickering, people hung up with, with, uh, 
with organizations and structures and blah, blah, blah. Maybe what we ought to say is have a pronouncement that no infantry unit goes outside the wire without something overhead that looks out to 400 meters for any uh, individual soldiers and out to 1,000 meters to detect groups of enemy and mortars. Think how many lives that would have saved. We've been at this now for 15 years. A drone, excuse me, is a model airplane. Um, the other issue is the human dimension. Uh, came up with this in 1992 when Barry McCaffrey was testifying before Congress, and Congress said, we beat them with, with our materiel, didn't we? And Barry McCaffrey said, remember this quote? We could exchange equipment with the Iraqis, we still would have beat them. What he's saying is there was something intrinsically better about the American soldier. And we all know what many of those things are. You know, we are the only, one of the few armies in the world with an NCO Corps. We have an adaptive, creative officer corps, uh, on and on and on. You produce them here. But so we ask ourselves, or I ask myself in this book, yeah, but why can't we leverage the human behavioral and cognitive sciences to make them even better? What is there to say that we can't, you know, it's the old saying that uh, the Air Force and the Navy man the equipment and the Army and the Marine Corps equip the man. To us, it's not what's on the soldier, but what's in the soldier that's even more important. And the human sciences, thanks to research mainly in things like PTSD, have come so far in the last 15 or 20 years that we can amplify the ability of the American soldier and Marine to perform in combat. We can inure him against the horrors of PTSD. We have the, the ability to do that. One quick example. Okay, one more war story. Um, I promise, it's the last one. In 1967, in air-to-air -air combat, the exchange ratio with the North Vietnamese Air Force was one to one, which is embarrassing because in Korea it was 13 to one. What was the problem? Well, to the Air Force, the problem was technology. To the Navy, it was the human dimension, and they invented Top Gun. They had learned from research uh, that 96% of all the shoot downs over North Vietnam occurred in a pilot's first four mission. By the way, same thing in Vietnam. 80% of all soldiers killed in small units in Vietnam died during the first two months of their tour. So why not give close combat experience to fighter pilots bloodlessly? Why not create a simulation that's so real that everything but fear of violent death is built, cooked into the experience, and they go off to war inoculated with their first four missions. And the kill ratio went from one to one to seven to one. Why don't we have a top gun for our small units? If you're familiar with Samsung, well, not the cell phone, but the technology Samsung has done recently on virtual reality. We're at a point now where we can, we can we can inure soldiers using virtual simulations, not to experience bloodlessly the decision making and the reaction to close combat once or twice. We can do it thousands of times for virtually no cost. Why don't we have a virtual gym? Why don't we treat our individual, you know how many squads the Marine Corps has? The Army won't tell me theirs. Marine Corps has got 692 squads, infantry squads. 692 for the entire Marine Corps. I'm sorry, 692 entities in a country of 330 million. Why can't we treat these 11 guys in your squads as if they are National Football League teams, offense, defense, and special teams? Why can't we treat them separately? Why can't we spend time creating superbly bonded bands of brothers in these teams to make them, to inure them to the horrors of war before the first shot and fire. I remember Mattis told me this story. He said, the Battle of Fallujah, went into this building at two in the morning, filthy, dirty infantry Scott sitting there, peering out through a, through a hole in the wall, and <laughs> Mattis said, who's in charge here? Silence. Well, I did, who's in charge? Where's your squad leader? Then the answer came, well, he's getting rations. He went back for a report. He's, he's evacuating a soldier, blah, blah, blah. In other words, the squad leader wasn't there. Well, okay, who's in charge? And he said, instantaneously, 10 fingers all pointed to this Lance Corporal. He said, I'm in charge, Lance Corporal. Why? Well, because the American soldier Marine has an amazing habit when faced with a fear of violent deaths to pick the guy who's going to keep him alive. Well, why can't we do that before we crawl into a building in Fallujah? What is there in the science of, of human selection that we can't find that Lance Corporal and make him an E6 and send the E6 back for recruiting command? Why can't we do that? We can. 
We just don't. Okay, I'm going to do one more thing and then I'm going to open it up to questions. A touch. Okay, one more war story that I'm finished. Uh, 1944, Battle of the Hedgerows, uh, the German kill ratio to Americans was four to one. Um, and the question was why? Well, the answer was that the Germans had learned on the Eastern Front, when you're in close quarters, like a village or something like that, that instead of keeping quiet and listening for the squad leader to say something, they just shouted, screamed, sang, and ripped the opposing hedgerows with MG42 fire and psychologically broke the back of the American units who were huddled in fear. Because the Germans understood the value of touch. Touch is the psychological glue that bonds soldiers together. It comes to the Civil War notion of the touch of a sleeve. Well, when you're in a battlefield that's so dispersed that a brigade may be controlling a piece of territory the size of Rhode Island, how do we, in close combat, connect soldiers together by touch? And the answer is right here. You know, my grandson tweets a I don't know, a thousand times a day. I don't know what a tweet is. But he's a high school student, and that's how he communicates with his buddies. So he graduates from high school, he joins the infantry, and when he gets in close combat, these disappear. Why? Why can't you have a soldier network? Why can't you have a soldier system? Why can't you have the ability exploiting this type of digital technology to allow a soldier to maintain that level of touch? We've proved time and time again it's essential to prevent palliation or the emotional collapse of a unit. We don't do it. Oh, here's the other thing. And I'll shut up here. Here's the other thing. If you, you know, the National Football League uses sensors tied to these things to measure galvanic skin response, uh, rhythmic breathing, heart rate, and now they're beginning to develop the technology to measure brain waves. So let's say you had the ability to collect this together and put it in a platoon leader or a company commander's cell phone. We all know that units break psychologically before they break physically. So why don't you have a way to sit there and measure the emotional state of a unit on one of these so that you can pull them out of contact, put in second platoon, so the unit doesn't collapse from emotional trauma. Do that. I could go on and on. I got a bunch of these. I'm not going to cover them all because I know you're so interested in what I just said, you're all going to go back out and buy my book, and I appreciate that. But I'm going to spend some time uh, now uh, without any further talking to answer your question. I know you're out there. I can hear you breathing. Sure. Yeah. Sir, Colonel Eric Kober, uh, Chief of Military Science. Uh, with the, the great amount of vision you have on, on history and as a futurist, as you mentioned earlier, do you think our Army vision right now is visionary enough? No. But there's a reason for it. Um, and it's partly my fault or our fault. Um, I think for events that have occurred recently, in many ways, the Army has become afraid of the future. I saw this at AUSA in spades just, what, I think a couple of weeks ago. Here's what I mean. Two things. Number one, the Army still has its threat horizon pulled in close because they're fighting a war. Not as intense a war, but they're still fighting a war. And that focuses you inward. Secondly, a whole generation of our senior leaders have been raised in the practical army, fighting a war. And so the exercise of leaving, sort of stepping out of your skin and climbing out to a mountain uh, 30 years ahead and looking back uh, is an uncomfortable proposition. Uh, the third thing is the army has had a terrible record of anticipating the future and equipping it. FCS comes to mind, others that you're familiar with, the, Future Scout Helicopter, uh, Crusader, uh, Howitzer System, uh, uh, the Armored Gun System, I could go on and on. And so that's created, I think, uh, a sense among the senior Army leadership that perhaps the way to approach the future is through incrementalism, gradually creeping up to the future instead of leaping ahead. And of course, the fourth thing, which is obvious to everybody in this room, is money. If you don't have the resources to buy a new tank, then what the hell is the sense of you know, going to the drawing boards and drawing it all out? And so I, and what I do is when I talk to Army groups, I say, you've got to get over that. You know, looking out beyond two palms doesn't cost you anything other than brain power. Now, don't get me wrong. There are exceptions to this. Two men come to mind, many of you I hope you know, 
One is H.R. McMaster, who is the three-star tra uh, Tradoc, is on it. Uh, he believes in a lot of the things that we've all been saying. And the other is General Bob Brown, who many of you may know used to be the CAT commander. Another guy, one of my heroes, who really understands the centrality of future gazing and ensuring uh, that we win in the future. But I think this is a tough road uh, to drive, to, to, to cross over, and the Army needs to start now here at West Point, PME institutions, and other places to get back on track when it comes to future gazing. I know that's harsh, but I think it's true. But I'm retired. Sir, I'm a Captain Wilder, I'm an MS-300 instructor. Um, I didn't actually raise my hand, but I was thinking about what I was going to ask. And uh, I want to say this is necessarily a question, but maybe a refinement to some of your points about technology uh, or a counterpoint. So in my relatively limited and pathetic experience in the Army so far uh, compared to yours, uh, I think that I've seen a lot of the things you're suggesting. So for instance, you know, the drones as a, uh, in Afghanistan, we had T-Hawks, which were just, you know, garbage cans and they fell out of the sky all the time. We had Pumas. I'm an engineer, so we had doe canes, which would, were you know, remote control kind of drone that could try to clear the road for us. And then you know, on staff level, you have uh, CPOFs, and in those you have like chat rooms that you can talk with for attacks and stuff. Uh, and then the newer thing with, someone might help me out here, but uh, they're trying to give soldiers, uh, like down on the single soldier level, like wrist pad or, uh, what is it again? Yeah, yeah CS-15. So I think a lot of these things are implemented, but my, from my experience, it seems like we just do we, uh, we bid it out and then we get some terrible company right. to make a terrible technology that we already right. have like good examples right. of. So I would almost argue for your point that uh, the Army needs to move, maybe move away from that and, and use the technology we have. Because I see that's where we're failing. Rather than like trying to implement the ideas you're talking about, we're just yeah. failing with our technology. Yeah, boy, that's a great point. Um, I agree with you. I don't think the problem is necessarily understanding what's out there or what we need. The problem comes in two things. In applying it to the battlefield function, as you just said, efficiently and sufficient numbers. Uh, and number two, in making the right stuff. We, we, we always seem to come up short. And, and the problem with that is that if it doesn't work like it's advertised, then all the naysayers who generally perform, uh, constitute the majority of those who are interested parties in this immediately stand up. As I saw in FCS time and again, and say, see, I told you it wouldn't work. What's wrong with you guys? Yeah, but if you stick with us a little longer, it'll work. No, no, get out of here. It's not going to work. We'll go back to whatever. And, and I see that a lot. I see it a lot from the practical soldiers out there who who uh, are adverse to this sort of cutting edge technology. I, I, you know why I really see it? Is I see it in the human dimension. I see it in, in accepting new ways of training, new ways of visioning, new uh, simulations in particular. Um, uh, things that industry have been dealing with now for years and that and our tech companies are cranking out by the truckload. Um, but I don't see enthusiasm from the Army to buy into that on a large level that would make a difference in how we, it's all boutique stuff, you know? Oh yeah, well they got this new simulator over at Fort Benning and it's already kind of under a bunch of tarpaulins, but if you want to go over there tomorrow afternoon for an OPD and you can try it. As opposed to saying no small unit deploys to a theater of war until every small unit leader and soldier in that unit has qualified uh, on this close combat simulator. You don't go to war until you, until you check the block. That's the difference. Yeah. Sir, in your book, Yellow Smoke, you talked about what would happen if you actually did have the never blinking eye uh, yeah. in combat. Right. Uh, so it would be like a small unit having combat, but they're, they're in the stadium of a football. Right. So if I believe what you said, that the American people's will truly is what drives our combat operations, but the unblinking eye would now not only change the character of war for the soldier, but also for the American society. Yeah, boy, well, that's well, good. Well, yeah, I, I will be the first to admit, I got a little sort of outside my comfort zone on that one. Uh, and perhaps I shouldn't have. Um, Boy, that's a good question. I, 
Let me try this. If war were a one-sided endeavor, and if our enemies were stupid, and not themselves adaptive, then everything I wrote in that piece of the chapter would probably convey. But I think what we're finding is that the rate of adaptation among our enemies, um, particularly because of social networking, their ability to speak with each other and to commune, and to develop ways to defeat us has become so good, that a one-dimensional approach that doesn't build a killing mechanism into it will ultimately fail, uh, in my opinion. You know, at the end of the day, look, uh, we all want to win with diplomacy, with cyber, we want to win with uh, economics, but at the end of the day, there's something about having to kill somebody that's still fundamental to our profession. I hope you guys are telling that to your cadets, because it's true. Please uh, join me in a round of applause for General Scales. So up next on Friday, we have Masha Gessen, who will talk to us about uh, Vladimir Putin, if you're, you're welcome to attend that. And we also have a book signing down here. The bookstore is coming in to set up books if you'd like to buy one or uh, speak with General Scales or have one of your books signed by him. So please, uh, please stay around. Thanks so much for coming. Thank you, guys. I appreciate it. Thank you.